Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, Robert, you should know that spring break looms for us. <laughs> if it's, I'm jealous. It's early, so I'm really <laughs> delighted that the people came after classes and before spring break. Let me jump immediately to our conversation. Great. Quick introduction. Mm -hmm. And so Robert F. Smith is the founder, chairman, and CEO of Vista Equity Partners. Vista has more than $95 billion in assets under management and oversees a portfolio of over 80 companies, which companies employ more than 90,000 people globally. Robert's an active philanthropist. He sits on the boards of several prominent institutions, including the Business Roundtable, Columbia Business School, and Carnegie Hall, to name just a few. He's also founded several initiatives, including the Found Two Foundation, dedicated to preserving the African-American experience, and the Student Freedom Initiative to help relieve student debt for STEM students at HBCUs. Please join me in welcoming Robert for what I hope and know will be a fun conversation. Thank you, thank you. Happy to be here, excited. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so Robert, I have an empty card here for things that emerge in our conversation. Good. A couple of themes I wanna make sure I hit. Why don't we start at the beginning? Sure. I think beginnings are a nice place to start. I care very much about origin story. Mm. Yeah. So you're from Denver, mm -hmm. I read. Right. Born and raised. Yeah. And before we get going, I'm curious about your path. Yeah. Boy born in Denver. Yeah. And then you leave Denver and you go to college in New York. Right. You're doing engineering, I believe. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about Denver, sure. Cornell Engineering. Sure. It's, um, and again, thank you and thank you all for welcoming me to this beautiful community. Um, uh, I, I will say, you know, I've, I've always chuckled, and I'll, I'll say this because I don't think we're being recorded. You know, the smartest students always come from Yale. Um, the hardest working are from Cornell, uh, uh, and the most diligent are from Columbia. But anyway, um, we ignore that other place in Cambridge. But uh, I think it's important, origin is important, um, because I always think about it, it's what informs who you are, and it creates that initial impression uh, about what it is that you are here on this earth to do. I grew up in what I call a beloved community, and um, many of you are uh, too young to know an America that was deeply segregated. You know, I grew up in an all-black uh, community, all-black neighborhood. Uh, at a point in time, I grew up in 19, I was born in 1962, before uh, African Americans had voting rights and had, you know, a number of the civil rights that we, that we have today that we still have to continue to fight for. But I do recall growing up in a community with my parents uh, and the community members who, were, who, who cared about the children in our community. A village, kind of. Yes, and yes. I saw it every day expressed. Expressed and you know, if one of us had to go to the store, you saw you know, the, the people looking out the door and making sure you were okay, and if you did something wrong, your parents would know by the time you got home. Um, and all those were, were, were elements and expressions of, of, of love and care. Uh, I saw the structure of it. Uh, my father, um, my mother, both, they both had doctorates in education. But I saw things like uh, at a period of time when we used to get a lot of snow in Denver, um, fourth generation from there, uh, they wouldn't come plow the streets for days in mm. my neighborhood. And we were going through busing to desegregate the schools. And so four or five days later, a bus would come through, we'd get on the bus, go to school, and then we'd go to the other neighborhoods. And guess what? Their streets were not only you know, plowed, but they were dry. They had been plowed three, four days earlier. Mm. And my parents, you know, course found out about this were incensed. My father created a, a, it was called the North City Park Civic Association, and in essence pulled together a group of community leaders and said, this is, this is unjust and it's wrong. Here's the problem. Okay, if you don't plow our streets, we can't get to work. If we can't get to work, our children don't eat. Mm -hmm. And so they brought that effort to bear, I'll call it almost immediately, and I remember within a couple of years from kindergarten to second grade, we at least got one line plowed down the street mm -hmm. um, where we could now, you know, people could get to work. Now, of course, my dad's like, now you have to go shovel the snow, me and my brother, to mm -hmm. get to that one line in the street. But it made a huge difference to have a community that cared, and my parents and others in the community cared about the well-being of the whole community. Mm -hmm. I saw that through the implementation of the Head Start programs as well, just making sure our kids had the ability to, you know, get meals and, and programming prior to going to, to school and making sure that you know, those sorts of things were, 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 were managed mm -hmm. by the community, you know. And then, I, and then I'll call it the softer parts of this where, you know, parents, most of them had two, two working parents in the household where I grew up. But, you know, the kids got out of school at 3 o'clock. Yeah. By the time you got back from the bus, it's, you know, 4.15. 
And guess what? Parents still weren't off work. And so you saw people in the community figuring out, okay, where are all the kids going to gather in the evenings or in the mm -hmm. afternoons until their parents came home? And you saw the resourcing of, I call it the, you know, the snacks and the, you know, and then the older kids teaching the younger kids math or English or spelling, whatever it might've been. It was a, you know, K through six for me in that mm -hmm. period of time. And I always felt cared for, not just by my parents, but by the adults in the community and of course other children yes. uh, and older children in the community. So again, that is what informed my idea of what life should be like mm -hmm. and what living in a community should be like. And you saw people giving, I'll call it in, in essence, through their ability uh, in mm -hmm. a community. Some people could actually give music lessons, which they did. Uh, some people could just give a space where kids could come after school until their parents came home. And some would do things like my parents to actually help uh, engage with institutions I see. to enable our community to advance. Let me ask, did that, what about your childhood experience informed your decision of where to go to college and what to major in once there? Right. I'm curious. Uh, it really was in high school. Um, I went to a public school, public high school. It's actually the same high school my father went to. And it just so happened uh, my junior year, they introduced computers for the first time. Mm -hmm. And you know, my mother said, well, that looks like an interesting course. Why don't you take it? And I yeah. said, sure, I guess that I don't have a choice because my mom told me to take it. So <laughs> I took this course. Uh, I'm sure many of you have that experience. I took this course and I was fascinated by it. And I asked the teacher at the time, I said, how does this thing work? Mm -hmm. And they said, well, it's this thing called a, a, a microprocessor and, and it's, it's powered by this thing called a transistor. And I said, well, who invented that? Yeah. And they said, well, these people at Bell Laboratories. I said, uh -huh. well, what's Bell Laboratories, right? And so they said, well, it's this place where a lot of inventions are. And I said, well, do we have one in Colorado? And my teacher said, I have no idea. So I went down to our career guidance person and I said, you know, do we have a Bell Labs? They said, yeah, there's one actually in Colorado. So I called them. And I picked up the phone, I called him, and I said, hey, I'm a student, I'm, I'm at, uh, at, at Denver East High School, mm -hmm. I'm taking AP classes, I'm getting all A's in them, do you, do you have any summer internships? And they said, yeah, if you're between your junior and senior year in college. And I said, well, that's great, I'm a junior in high school, I'm taking AP classes, just like being in college, you know, where do I apply? Yeah. And she said, well, you can't, come back when you're junior in, in, in college. So I literally called this human resources person every day for two weeks. Yeah. And I left a message uh, after the second day because she wouldn't take the call anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and then I literally called her every Monday for five months. In June, I got a call back. And they said, listen, a student from MIT didn't show up. If you are interested, please come for an interview. We're and not offering calling. you a job. Yeah, stop calling. <laughs> uh, and yeah. these were no answering machines. So my dad says, oh, this woman called and left a message. And so, so I go out there and I get this job at Bell Laboratories. And that's where I basically end up every summer and every time I had a break from, from college. So in that expression, I always tell people a couple lessons there. One, you know, tenacity is critically important and two, MIT students aren't that reliable. But anyway, <laughs> um, hopefully no MIT students in here. I don't mean that personally because my nephew finished from there. But he's actually not that reliable either. Uh, anyway, um, something about the color. Yeah, 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 yeah. But anyway, uh, what I did learn though was in Bell Labs, I had a mentor. Mm -hmm. His name was Vic Hauser. Okay, he had a PhD in what was called solid state physics, undergraduate in chemical engineering, and he went to Brown. And so I'm like, well, tell me about this chemical engineering thing. Yeah. And so I shared an office with him, which was a third the size of this stage, mm -hmm. or a fourth the size of this stage. And I shared an office, and think about it, I'm 17 years yeah. old, with this guy who's got a PhD in solid state physics, and we talked every day, all day, for so long as he wanted to listen to me, right? Mm -hmm. And the questions I would ask. And he told me about chemical engineering. And as we went through that, I learned there's only three or four places where they really produce outstanding chemical engineers, and Cornell was one of them. Mm. So that's how I learned about Cornell. I see. And that's why I decided to go there. I see. So it explains Cornell in engineering. I get that. But you don't make your life and career in engineering. Do you ever work as an engineer upon graduation? Six years. Yeah. Okay. So I graduated uh, Cornell and I worked for six years, worked in applied research and development. I earned a couple US patents, European patents, bunch of trade secrets, right. and I loved life. Mm -hmm. Okay. I thought about, and I, I was telling a group of students earlier today, at that point in time in my life, I didn't think there was any more noble pursuit than to come up with an idea that no one in the history of mankind had ever come up with uh. and put that into practice. 
-hmm. And I thought, you know, an expression of that was, of course, getting patents, yes. right? Or creating some trade secrets. And there was nothing greater. Mm -hmm. But then you have to think about as one evolves in one's life, okay, but to what purpose mm -hmm. is that serving? And in that case, of course, it's serving, in that case, a greater good for the corporation, which was fine. Mm -hmm. um, but, and personally, to be able to do something, to invent something, to come up with something, to do the work, to unpack the challenge, you know, the, and, and unpack that, that problem, and what I call come up with an elegant solution yes. to that problem. That was the most noble pursuit. And then I started to understand that you can do that in multiple places. And it can actually have a wider impact and reverberation. In those times, I would actually go down to Tuskegee and I would teach a class in chemical engineering or engineering mm -hmm. to the students there. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I loved that work and the expression of what I called you know, my, my, my pursuit in chemical engineering. Mm -hmm. But then I learned the difference between labor and capital. And that's when I thought, you know, maybe I should think, rethink about what is my next stage mm -hmm. of development. And that's when I decided to go back to business school. I see and understanding that difference. I see, so you made this decision to go to a perfectly fine business school. Yes. We're not gonna, we're not gonna diss Columbia. <laughs> so you went there, right. and you got your MBA, right. and you leave business school mm -hmm. upon, upon achieving your MBA. Right. You go on to a career, uh, you became a banker. You yeah, Goldman, Goldman Sachs. Sachs. This I know about. Right, yeah. right. So to, to, to finish that, that part of it, you know, I am uh, in business school first year, and I do well. We we had you know various awards. I won an award, you know, yeah. top business school student first year. So I had to come back for the summer graduation. So between first and second year, mm -hmm. and there was a guy by the name of John Utendall, uh, who was a dear dear friend and a mentor. Uh, he hates that I say that because he's so much older than me. Um, <laughs> and uh, he was delivering the, the keynote address. They gave me my award. He brings me over. He said, Hey, you know, you've got a really interesting background. Have you ever thought about a career in investment banking? And I said, well, there's a bunch of investment bankers in my class and I don't like any of them. And, uh, <laughs> and he, says, uh, he says, well, why not? I said, well, you know, they, they think they know everything and it's, 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 you know, it's, it's, and they're really arrogant. I said, look, I'm an engineer. We do know everything, it bothers us, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, but honestly, I don't really understand what you all do. I don't understand what bankers, I was an engineer. I had no idea what bankers did. I didn't know any bankers outside of the ones in my class. And talking about, oh, we go on these road shows and IPOs. I'm like, well, that doesn't sound like fun. That's how we travel. But you know, I was traveling engineer to Germany and a bunch of I said, ah, that's, I'm not sure what you do. But then I realized something. As I started talking to John, and he introduced me to a lot of friends uh, in the industry. And being a scientist, you know, you collect data. I literally mm -hmm. did, you all think you had a hard, I did 100 interviews my fresh, basically my, my, that second year of business school, mm -hmm. and I decided the only job I liked in mergers, or in, in investment banking was mergers and acquisitions. Mm -hmm. And I said it because besides M&A, you know, M&A, think about it, it's a, it's a, it's a CEO and, and board level discussion, mm -hmm. okay? It's how assets get transferred across this planet, right? M&A and divorce, those two things, right? <laughs> But those were, that to me was quite fascinating. It's like, how do you think about going and buying at that time a billion dollar company or a two billion dollar asset, mm -hmm. right? And how do you come up with that strategic thought pattern and justify it with some financial, uh, financial analysis that says, this is why this makes sense. That was fascinating. I see. So that's why I decided I'm going into M&A and that was it. And I figured out that at that time, there are really only six really good practitioners of, of, of mergers mm -hmm. and acquisitions, and it is still an apprenticeship business. Mm -hmm. um, some have done a really good job institutionalizing the practice of it. For the most part, though, it is an institution where you have a person who covers an industry, and they have five or six associates or analysts around them, and they learn that. And yes. you don't learn from anyone else. Goldman at the time, I think, did the best job where you could work with different partners, yeah. and as a result of that, get a, a broader, deeper, more diverse experience I see. In, in, in learning that craft and learning that practice, and that's why I ended up at Goldman Sachs in M&A. I see, so you, you're, good, you're at Goldman, I'm guessing you're thriving at Goldman, things are going well. You stay there for a bit, yeah. and then you launch upon the venture that, that makes you world famous. You're going to found Vista. Right. That's a big step, man, it's risky uncertain, were there role models? What was the opportunity you saw? Yeah. You were, at the time, a young African-American man 
launching on this incredibly heroic and risky, as I've said earlier, venture. Great. Talk me through that. Yeah. You know, you and I chatted a little bit about this. I, as an investment banker at Goldman, I probably sat through in six years, I don't know, 200 board meetings advising clients. Mm -hmm. There was only one other African American in any of those board meetings once. Mm. Okay. So I looked at that landscape and look, I was doing extremely well. In fact, what, what had occurred was I was made what was called the business unit manager, the M&A group, 96, or, and, and uh, I was asked to go out to the West Coast and start our tech group. So I was our first M&A baker on the ground, focused on technology in the spring of 1997. Okay, this is, you know, I mean, trees were growing to the sky, right? Mm -hmm. And I got uh, the great pleasure of working on a couple of companies, one company by the name of Apple Computer, which you probably heard of. Heard of it. Uh, heard of that one. A company by the name of Yahoo, a little company by the name of eBay, yeah. a little company by the name of Hewlett Packard, mm. okay, Texas Instruments, Microsoft. Because at the time, no one wanted to cover those companies because they weren't East Coast based companies. And if you're on the West Coast and you were Goldman Sachs at that time, you were off in the hinterland someplace. I see. But I saw opportunity because I said, you know, if I stay on the East Coast, I'm going to be crowded out by a bunch of people. Remember those six analysts and associates yeah, yeah. who've been around that managing director for five, six years? I see. Remember, I worked for six years before I went back to business school. Okay. So I was a little older and hadn't had the analyst experience. I came in as an associate. Mm -hmm. And so now you're saying, well, wait a minute, that person's been working with them for four years. What's my chances of actually going in and actually becoming what I call the favored son I see. in that context versus going out in the greenfield? Mm -hmm. So I had already decided to take that risk. Let me ask, was your engineering expertise and background helpful in determining or highlighting the opportunity for you? No question. Okay. Okay. Probably three reasons. One, I call it the land of the blind and one-eyed man is yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. No one knew about technology for the most part. Think about it. On the East Coast, our expression of technology was IBM, mm -hmm. okay, Northrop Grumman, okay, Lockheed Martin, okay, and the defense contractors. Yeah. That was the view of what tech was. Mm -hmm. And then you had a bunch of our corporate finance people out on the West Coast, and they're doing IPOs, right, for every company that could go out. Right. But who was doing M&A out there? And we used to call them the harm group. H&Q, Hamburg and Quist, you guys probably don't remember these, Alex Brown, or, or, or Montgomery Security, or Robertson Stevens in, in Montgomery Securities. And they were making hay because they actually had people on the ground focused on doing M&A. Now you go out there as Goldman Sachs, okay? And now A, I knew technology because yeah. I was an engineer, okay? Mm -hmm. B, I had actually come from the M&A group out of, out of Goldman, where we had built, and I had built some systems for doing analytics for M&A activity in this thing called, you guys never heard of this, uh, Asterix. You ever heard of that? No. Okay. You heard a thing called Excel? It was a precursor to that, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And I built a system there where you could actually now input this data and actually decrease the amount of time, so engineering, decrease yeah. the amount of time it took to do an analysis for M&A activity. And most of that stuff then was stock for stock pooling, but now of course, you know, mm -hmm. different, different transaction structures. And the third thing was I could actually go talk technology with these CEOs mm. and understand the expression of chemical engineering as with my generation was process controls, mm -hmm. okay? The prior generation, it was unit operations. I, how do you take oil and make you know, different forms of distillates, mm -hmm. okay? My generation was how do you put in programmable logic controllers and control a, a, a system okay. as, that's not anal uh, from, di from analog to digital. Mm -hmm. So I could actually go in and have these conversations with these CEOs and at a, you know, in some cases a bit to bite level that none of these bankers could. Got it. That was a key differentiator for me so that certain of the CEOs would say, no, I want Robert here. Because yeah. he actually understands what it is that we do mm -hmm. and how it actually works. Mm -hmm. And I use that as the advantage to create the relationships. I see. I and see. and excel, accelerate my career yeah. on a relative basis there versus New York. Mm -hmm. So it, does expertise now, we're going to talk about, I want to hear about Vista, the founding years, how it grew and so forth. But you have portfolio companies under management. Right. How, what attention do you give, if any, to the expertise of those leaders? A ton. Um, so 
So let me tell you how, how Vista is expressed in the marketplace. I like to think about our organization in call it three houses in a foundation. One house is our investment team. I've got about 190 people who do nothing every day but look for enterprise software companies to invest in. Okay, so we're looking for a certain, again, we don't do consumer, it's you know, mission critical, business critical, enterprise mm -hmm. software. 190 people, the biggest team in the world that does that. Mm -hmm. I've got about 140 people in our value creation unit, okay? And value creation unit actually focuses on delivering what I call a set of best practices and how do you run a software companies to the management teams of the companies that we invest in and what we buy. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the okay. third part is what I'll call the capital raising and the foundations, all the legal compliance and all those sort of yeah. things. But it's that middle piece, that value creation piece, which is the critical analytical engine to understanding is this executive and the group of executive or ELT, executive leadership team that we are working with, uh, do they understand how to create value in that business beyond where we, where we bought the company? Look, okay. a lot of them did a great job, you know, starting the business and going to 50 million or 100 million or 200 mm -hmm. million in ARR, which annual recurring revenue or whatever it might be, but do they know what it takes to get to a billion? Got it. Now the thing to think about in the world I live in of enterprise software, it's still a relatively young industry, okay? 97% of these companies are still private, the vast majority are still being run by their founders, okay? Mm -hmm. And the founders typically are running the biggest business they've ever run that day, okay? Because okay? they grew this business up. And a lot of the things they did to grow it to 50 or 150 in ARR is not the same things you need to grow to 400 or to go from small to medium business to enterprise, mm -hmm. okay? Or from an on-prem to a cloud, yeah. okay? And so part of what we have to assess is do they actually understand what it takes, because we will articulate, because we've done this over 600 times now, mm -hmm. okay? Do they understand what it takes to go from here to here? Are they willing to make the changes, the investments, take the risks associated with that, and implementing the infrastructural changes in many cases, the cultural changes in some cases, the financial changes in some cases, to get from here to here? And if they don't, what, it is, what is it that we have to now do in engaging with that management team, which sometimes means, guess what? Part of that management team Might is not suited for the growth, okay? Or we have to bring people up, or we have to bring people from other parts of our organization to support what it is as the underwriting ambition. Interesting. Okay, why? Because we have this systemic approach to value creation. That value creation unit, mm -hmm is designed to bring these sets of ever, uh, best practices that have to naturally evolve because I call it our substrate evolves. Technology evolves every day, okay? Latest iteration of a public evolution is generative AI. Mm -hmm. But what's the implications of that? Is it existential risk in, in certain of your companies? Yeah. Or, is it an enabling, uh, or is it an enabling factor mm -hmm. in those businesses? Yeah. So we have to focus on that as an organization so that we can drive insights, information, tools, capabilities, best practices from a $3 billion software company to a $30 million software company in a way that effectively moves that whole organization along. I see. Okay, so that is how we think about and how I think about the organizational design and the implementation of value creation mm -hmm. and engaging with management teams to drive those businesses forward. I, this is interesting. So I, you've broken up, you've described how uh, Vista's act, within Vista's activities, there are three buckets, the identifying value creation and then the, I'm gonna call it back at right. the capital yeah, raising. Yeah. Yeah. I'm assuming that for each of those buckets you're looking for, uh, when you make a hire, you're looking for people with raw CPU. Are they good? Are they quick? Are they nimble of mind? Are they learned? That kind of thing. Curious. That Sometimes. Kind of... Sometimes. We'll keep going. <laughs> but so I want to hear if you're not. I want to yeah, hear yeah. if you're not. But then there's this other piece, which is that in your writings and things I've read of your statements, you believe very strongly in the power of a diverse leadership team. I'm curious about why you think that matters. Yeah. Like what evidence you believe exists in the world out there that you've encountered, that diversity per se is relevant for the management, the proper management of business. Right. 
And I, I want to hear your thoughts about that. Yeah, great question. And I think about it in, you know, again, I'm, I'm a scientist at heart. Fair enough. You know, you and I chatted yes, about yes. that. What, what, you know, who are you at heart? Yes. And so I believe in the empirical evidence and you have to test it. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, you know, the good news is I've had uh, great opportunities to create testing grounds. I look at Vista today. We are one of the few gender parity firms of size uh, in, 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 frankly, in this whole industry. I see it. I have one company, it's a publicly traded company, where the, where the CEO is based in Wisconsin. When we bought the company seven years ago, mm -hmm. okay, it was not diverse by any stretch of the imagination. So I sit and I talk to the CEO, Dean. I'm like, well, Dean, tell me about what, what you, you know, your, your talent practice, talent management. And like most startups, you know, I, I, I decided to form the company here. I'm going to build my team here. I'm going to hire from around here. Mm -hmm. And you kind of get what's there. Mm -hmm. Okay. And he's you know, doing well and cranking along. And the good news is he's one of those industries that's very little competition. But then he started seeing a stalling of growth in wage inflation dynamics because he, he exhausted his pool. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which happens. Indeed. Right? And say, okay, well, so let's plug you into some of our other, and we create pools of talent and on-ramps of opportunities where I think about it. Like I run a, we have a program called Intern XL. You get, I gave you my expression of how important an internship was for me. Yes. And so now I have an Intern XL platform. We've got 19,000 students who come from HBCUs or MSIs, minority serving institutions, STEM oriented only, who now have, I think we have 200 corporate clients, I said, plug into this channel, mm -hmm. okay, because we do aptitude testing, personality profile, all that sort of, and then all of a sudden, he said, wow, I had no idea. Of course you didn't, because how would he, right? Right. right? And now we create floods of talent into his organization, mm -hmm. and then floods of talent, of course, in the C-suite and the board, and guess what? We we're actually able to inflect the growth of the company, okay? Yeah. So the way I like to think about it is, well, what was the empirical evidence? Well, I see an inflected growth, yes. okay, and profitability of a business. And he will tell you it's because he, he, he levered our talent engine mm -hmm. in order to now find highly qualified, highly talented people. And we have a whole boot camp system we can talk about later in terms of how we teach, train, develop our people mm -hmm. so they can now fuel the infrastructure of growth. Our average company, between when we buy it and when we, we have our, our, our sale, grows 20% organically. Okay? Remember, the raw materials, the cost of goods and software is people, mm -hmm. okay? So we have to hire, I've got 96,000 people. I have to hire 15,000 people this year. Okay, well, how do you do that? Now, you can come to Yale and we'll get 100, right? Yeah. All right? Or you can say, let me spread out the widest net possible and create systems to evaluate. So mm -hmm. our talent system globally 1.4 million people apply for jobs at our companies every 18 months. Wow. We test 400 to 500,000 every 12 months. What, what are you testing for, Robert? I'll tell you in a second. All right. And then we hire about 10 to 15,000 out of that talent pool. Okay. In our C-suites, I think it's 80% of our C-suites come from someone who has already been in our ecosystem teach, train, develop, and then keep them engaged in the ecosystem, and we find that to be effective. We do two things mm -hmm. in testing. We're looking for, I call it aptitude and personality profile. Okay, this is a long conversation. We should do this in one of your management meetings, but let me unpack yeah. it really quickly. This test, the early iteration of this test is actually 40 years old. There's a little company called IBM they used to do a thing called a data processing aptitude test. None of you all besides maybe four of us in this audience mm -hmm. ever remember, anybody know, heard of a thing called a punch card? Yeah. Eight, yeah. man, love it, 10 people, <laughs> love it. Okay, I see a few gray hairs here. They're like, yeah, I remember that. Right, Fortran, you got it, right? <laughs> well, the way this used to work back in the day when you would write code is you'd actually have to write, you had 128 characters that you could write on one card, okay? And that would be one line of code, and then you'd have to write another line of code on the next card, and it would put a punch, and then you'd have to put them through a compiler and run them. Mm -hmm. And so the, when you write code, you'd actually have to look and see you know, how you were writing your code based on how these lined up. So yeah. this is a memory test at the end of the day, mm -hmm. right? 
And so IBM figured out if they just did some simple tests on memory capacity, mm. you would find out who would actually be good at data processing. Mm. Pretty straightforward, right? Okay. Yeah. Great, so that's kind of point one. I see. Then we found out the way to do this is we go to our best developers in our companies and we, we designed a similar test and we test them and they'd all have a similar profile. Yeah. And we go to our best salespeople and test them. They'd all have a similar, and our best services people, and they'd have a similar profile, right? And so when you do that, when you're looking at entry level people, yeah. you take their test and assess them versus how uh, your best people work in each of these characters. I see. So that's aptitude. I see. Then there's personality profile. Mm -hmm. It's a different thing, whole different test, right? Yeah. So the way I like to think about it is for a developer, you want a certain personality. Mm -hmm. Okay, and for salespeople, you want a different kind of personality, yes. <laughs> right, <laughs> right? Right. Right. And so you want to assess you with your with your your developers. You want them to be, you know, absolute. Call it absolute morality as opposed mm -hmm. to situational, which is salespeople, mm -hmm. right? Salespeople also deal can deal with failure. Mm -hmm. Developers can't as much. You, you see what I mean? Salespeople, yeah. oh man, didn't get that sale. But they'll go back, you know, five minutes later, dust off, get back into right, the next right. one. Developers, it might ruin their psyche for a week, mm -hmm. right? The thing not to converge or something. Yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah, you've yeah. got to figure out. And so what we do is a lock and key system. So it isn't as simple as just testing aptitude or personality generally. We do it specifically for job function. I see. And as a result of that, we actually have much lower attrition in our new hires, which ultimately creates lower attrition long term. And for any of you who've ever been in corporations or have run them, what you find is your best, most productive people are well suited for that job. They want to do that job and they've been there for a long time. Yes. Okay, longer tenured. That's the dynamic we're looking to systemically create across all of our portfolio companies. Mm -hmm. So that's part of that value creation system that is unique. There was one of the young people in the meeting earlier say, well, how is Vista different, right? That's one of those, no one does that. I see. It's a lot of work, mm -hmm. but in my mind, it is one of the key value creating activities that we do for now over 23 years. Interesting. So, so as a dean of a school, I am thought to be leading various activities. And some of the activities involve the faculty. A dean kind of leads from behind in the sense that the faculty are the permanent stewards of the school. They have a desire that we do this or not do that. I'm leaning by inflection, by tone, by persuasion, by wink, by nod, kind of like that. You're running Vista and your leadership uh, concept, uh, capacity, if you will, is much more direct and targeted and sharp. You can open a line of business, shut one down, et cetera. But even so, for your ideas to be implemented, you have to persuade people. Mm -hmm. You have to get buy-in. You have to get often enthusiastic buy-in. Two questions. How do you elicit that buy-in? And has the manner in which you elicited it, elicit it evolved over the course of your career? Yeah, great question. Um, it evolves naturally just as we have grown. Mm -hmm. So the early days, I think you had Betty here. In the early days of Vista, you know, there were 12 of us, okay. 15, sitting at my round table. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately people sitting on the couches around the round table. And you know, the dynamic I always encouraged uh, and elicited was most junior person speak first about their ideas and thoughts on what it is that we were talking about. So it wouldn't stifle Mm -hmm. or disable what I'll call free-flowing ideas and information. Look, and every now and then you get some veering off of that dynamic based on personalities yeah. and all that sort of stuff. But that's how I like to think about you know, it, it operating. Now we have 600 plus people in the organization. Mm -hmm. You can't round table everything. So of course I've created executive committees and private equity management committees and that sort of thing. And so you have to think about as a leader, you know, when do you, do you encourage, because I, it's important, and I, I say this, to create space. You know, I tell my team, my job is to create a place, it really is, where people can become their best selves. Mm -hmm. That's really what my job is. And so you have to create environments for that to happen. Mm -hmm. 
In some cases, it's an environment with tools and systems, and in some cases, it's a environment for a va with a vacuum, depending upon the type of person. Right. Some people can't fill vacuums. Some people can't operate in a space without them, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And so you have to discern, determine for the sphere of influence and followership that you touch every day, what is it that you have to create for that person to become their best selves? Now, of course, you have to think about the manifestation of their best selves being in the best interest of the stakeholders. Yes. Stakeholders, important, mm -hmm. okay? Because some can manifest and they may be really good investors, but they're not the kind of people that anyone else wants to be around, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And we're in an industry, it's an interesting industry, because if you do this well, you can create massive amounts of wealth for your people. Mm -hmm. And I like people who say, oh, money changes people. I do not believe that at all. It just reveals who they really are, <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. And so you have to be thoughtful about that as people grow and mature. And you all know in our industry, it's a young industry still. I mean, there's a few of us with, with gray yeah. hair, but I mean, my average age in my firm is probably 38. Wow. Okay. My senior people who've been with me 20 years, they're in their late 40s. Mm. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And so you have to continue as a manager to evolve the way that you manage that demographic and where are they going and who are they going to be yes. and who are they going to be when they have, quote unquote, more money than they ever thought they would ever have, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And what is it that, you, that, that they are doing with that capacity? Yes. And that capacity is in capital. It's in organizational ability. And, I, and I'm proud to sit, look, like all things, we've been around 23 years, I still have a 95% retention rate with VP level or above. But if you look at my VP level or above, I've got less than 5% who didn't start as an analyst or an associate mm. at Vista. Mm. They grew up through the system. Interesting. Okay, and I think that's an important part of hiring, right? Look, you, you've got to go through the half-lives. Would you mm -hmm. try to go through those half-lives in the analyst and associate? Half-life means this. If you hire 60 people in a class, X amount of time le later, you should have 30, and X yes. amount of time later, you should have 15, right? So there's, because some of them are like, wow, I thought private equity is what I really want to do, but it really isn't what I want to do, right? But you, you need to figure that out. Now, what you want to do is manage that to your schedule, and not to the randomness of people that you get. You talked about diversity. Yeah. I am not gonna rely on Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley and, you know, and Bank of America to feed my analyst and associate class. I only get half of my class and less than half of my class from those sources. We develop our own through internships mm. and summer internships from rising sophomores in college. <laughs> Because the last thing I, look, if I'm going to leave it to Goldman, Goldman's going to have their selectivity for what it is that meets their needs, right? right? Versus what it is that meets Your, our needs, yeah. which is a little different. Mm -hmm. So creating systems to support what is your own growth as opposed to, let me just go to Super Saturday and give another offer to somebody else. Now they got 43 offers, not 42. Yeah. You, you, you know what I mean? I think that's the wrong way to approach it. We want some offers for Yale SOMers, but I get the point. Yeah. I, I get the point. Yeah. So I want to pivot very slightly. Mm -hmm. You talked about how you help people within the organization realize their full potentiality, become their best selves, I think you, I think you said. But you're interested in helping others unrelated to Vista become their best selves as well. You have launched these onboarding initiatives. Um, you have very famously removed the burden of debt mm -hmm. from some college graduates. This is not Robert the Vista CEO. I want, I'm curious about that. Talk to me about that part of your life and yeah. activity. Yeah, it is exactly where, how we started the conversation. And you and I chatted about it in the other room, right? You know, we, we all grew up with some impression of who we, who, people who loved us, mm -hmm. wanted us to be, right? Mm -hmm. And I will tell my mother, you know, 87, turning 88 next month, bless her soul, bless her heart. She has no idea what I do for a living. 
<laughs> yeah. And doesn't care. Yeah. Okay? Right. What she cares about are the things that I do for our community. Mm -hmm. And so as a result of that, that's what I care about. I see. You mm -hmm. see? I'm with you. And so when I talk to her, you know, two, I probably got 14 texts from her already this morning because she read something that I need to be focused on. <laughs> um, when I talk to her, that's what we talk about. Mm -hmm. She's not asking me about some deal that got announced or some. She's like, well, did you see that young kid who played that cello so well? Okay, why hasn't he had an opportunity to go to Juilliard? Mm -hmm. Why don't you look into that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me go look yeah. into that, right? Yeah, I have a mom you know, like that. We had, we had, yeah, we had yeah. the Sphinx organization yeah. performing at the, um, which, is, which is an organization that's now gotten to, I think it's 35,000 inner city kids over the last 21 years. They just played at the, uh, at the Supreme Court. Um, I think last week my mother went. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. And you know, I usually go every year. I didn't yeah. go this year. I had, my kids had a chess tournament. That's, how many of y'all play chess in here? <laughs> okay. Did you ever play in chess tournaments? Anybody play in chess tournaments? This is a crazy culture. Let me tell you. <laughs> So my little boys, this is a little diversion, but it's actually fun yeah. to talk about. They, so my little boys, my eight and my seven-year-old, got into chess. My yeah. uncle played chess, my dad yeah. plays. So I started playing chess, and my seven-year-old's actually pretty good at it, right? So uh, my eight-year-old's good at it, too, just in case it's getting recorded. <laughs> and so I do these chess tournaments yeah. on the weekend. <laughs> anyway, yeah. it is the most insane culture. You think about a Texas football culture, it is worse than that yeah, yeah. in terms of the intensity and yeah. the teaching and the coaching. These people bring in grandmasters for like seven-year-olds to teach them how to play chess. <laughs> anyway, but it's actually fun and exciting. So anyway, I couldn't go to this thing because I'm, I'm telling my mom at this, mm -hmm. at this chess tournament. Uh, and she's like, well, th that's fine. I'm glad you're doing that for my grandsons. Yeah. But you really need to think about these kids, hmm. right? And so when I think about you know, the priority of my life, that is always something that is in my ear. What am I doing for my community yeah. to enable my community to more fully participate in things that I know about that they may not? Mm -hmm. Science, technology, you know, private equity, for dance. And so those, music, mm -hmm. yes. and now chess, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So those are the things that I'm like, okay, I can actually have an impact on. And I tell my teams all the time, I'm like, look, the good news about what it is that you, that you could, and I, it, every time I end a talk with, with my senior executives or my senior, you know, senior mm -hmm. private, you know, private equity executives and also portfolio companies, I leave, leave with one slide and it says, honor the opportunity. I said, you have to understand how few people have this opportunity. Okay, the ability to create wealth mm -hmm. and value and impact so many people. Less than 1% of the people on the planet get this chance in their lifetime to yeah. do something like that. So honor this opportunity to de and deliver it back to the communities that you care about yeah. in the forms that you care about. Mm -hmm. And so I tell them it's not all about capital, it's often about organizational capacity. I say, you all know how to think about changing an organization just like my dad did. Yeah. He was the only one, I think, in that community because he was an elementary school principal. Mm -hmm. He actually had to deal with a school board, mm -hmm. okay? Had to deal with the state government. So he knew how to navigate that to get our streets plowed. Yeah. I don't think anyone else in my neighborhood could have done that. Got it. You see what I mean? I do, I do. You all are gonna walk out of here with some skills and capabilities that no one else knows how to do in the community where you're operating. Use that. Mm -hmm. And that's what I encourage my team to do. That's, that's wonderful. Robert, I wanna make sure I leave time for some student questions. Oh, of course, sure. I have a question for you, though. So, <laughs> uh, sorry, I, 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 so, so you're running Vista. That's an 80 hour a week, 100 hour a week job. Mom's calling, she's texting. My mama probably <laughs> done, done text me four times. <laughs> right. About things to do. Right? There's your philanthropic work and so on. Talk to me about balance, Robert. 
about what has come to be called work-life balance. <laughs> how, how, how does Robert stay together and set? You see what I mean? Yeah. How, how, do you, how does one manage that? Yeah. You know, some days I will tell you there is no such thing as work-life balance. Because um, some days there isn't. Uh, and so part of what I do is I think about cycles and rhythms mm -hmm. that, that, that make me feel alive, okay? There are cycles in my life that are sometimes dictated by the, you know, of course, work. I've got to go here to do this mm -hmm. for this period of time, okay? And sometimes it's eight meetings in a day and fly for four hours and three, okay. And so in that, I say, what is it that's gonna inspire my soul? In some cases, I don't have time to do other thing, anything other than listen to a book hmm. or explore some music. I see. Okay? Because I don't want to read anything because I know I'm better off with my eyes closed right, during that right. time just so I can get that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I think about embedding in those rhythms things that excite my soul. When I am home and I am you know, doing my normal routines, I get up in the morning, I do, I read scripture mm -hmm. and I do meditation before, well, sometimes my seven-year-old gets up and does it with me, but yeah. before anybody's kind of up in and around the house, mm -hmm. okay, that does it for me. It. Sometimes it is, guess what, you know, I'm just on a plane talking to my wife, planning in the summer, it's like, okay, so once I get her priority as to where she wants to be, yeah. Yeah. I go back and say, okay, what concerts do I want to go to? Ah, <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. in that period of time, who's playing in those cities mm -hmm. that I want to go see, yeah. okay? But you kind of, it's, it's, it's those cycles. And, and then, of course, there's some things that you have to do selfishly. You know, for me, it is things like, you know, fly fishing. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a fly fisherman, world class, by the way. Um, really? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I will tell you, if you don't plan to go, you won't go. Mm -hmm. So then I plan a couple of those and then say, okay, and, and if I can make those uh, plan a week, if I can get three days, I'm uh, feeling golden, okay? Right. I also like to drive. We go the, on these rallies with the family. And so I'll plan two of those a year, mm -hmm. okay? So I just try to embed these psych with, within those rhythms and cycles elements that actually swing the, pe the pendulum see. of work and life, okay? Mm -hmm. If you go, like some of my tours are insane in terms of the, the travel that I have to do. I mean, ridiculous. And I will tell you, if I don't embed the things that, that keep me uh, excited, you, no one would do it. There's no amount of money that's worth that, okay? But if in those cycles you get a chance to, you know, express, yes. you know, humanity uh, and, and embrace humanity, that's what makes it fun for me. That's, that's a great answer yeah. and good advice. So I, I think there are mic runners running around. Um, let's turn the last few minutes over to some student questions right. or the oh, so questions from the audience. Four up. We've got one here. Mm -hmm. Hi, Mr. Smith. Um, thanks a lot for a very inspiring lecture. Uh, my name is Stacy, a first year MBA student. Um, we recently had an interesting case regarding hiring people who were successful in their previous role or in the industry. Um, and in that particular case, it was about hosp uh, hospitality, and it actually failed because there were a lot of industry changes, um, as well as um, just other types of changes that are happening that makes the trace that used to predict success no longer um, be applicable. So wondering, since you've had a lot of success with hiring people who were previously successful in that role or hiring similar uh, people who are similar um, to those people, do you build in specific mechanisms um, to account for diversity of personality and diversity of talent in case there's a rapid change in the organization or in the industry um, so that you have that diverse pool to fall back on and adapt? It's a great, it's a great question because it is, it is, it is a, something you have to deal with real time with people. In addition to you know, people are not machines. And so while what they did in the past may have been successful, they may have evolved and may have changed. And so the, the, 
the mechanism, I call it the elegant design of Vista. Mm -hmm. Okay, the important parts are feedback mechanisms and feed forward mechanisms. My operating MD is Betty, okay, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. The most important thing that they can do beyond, not beyond, the most important thing is staying in tune with the executive leadership team of that portfolio company and how they are progressing against the underwriting case and what it is we're looking to accomplish. And in some cases, you're like, mm, they did well the last two times, they're not doing well this time. And you have to recognize that because those past two times, they may have made enough money that now they're only coming in the office periodically. They're not building succession plans. There's at every system atrophies over time, okay? And so that's part of the role and the dynamic as an executive team is what is atrophy, okay? And in some cases, if we're holding a portfolio company for a long period of time, we did a great job with talent management or BPSS or whatever it might be, or you know, one of the things we implemented, and you go back and inspect, and there's some atrophy because the people who implemented it left. They are no longer as interested, all those sorts of things. So it's a great question. So as a senior leader, you have to understand people change. They evolve. They may not want to do that any longer. And you have to be prepared to take action and find other people who can be successful. None of this is perfect. Uh, and maybe that's why it's still a joy to do it, to kind of figure that out. I don't think there ever is an end goal in state where you don't have atrophy in these businesses, contrary to what you know, generative AI may tell you. It's an important part of being a manager that you, you have to actually consciously focus on. So that's a really good question, really good question. I can't, I can't see, so. Um. Hi, um, my Hi. name is Susan Reed. Um, Mr. Smith, I'm spellbound being here. This is amazing having you. Um, my question is around your philanthropic strategy. So do you measure success based on social return on investment or how do you kind of make calls about where you're gonna invest your money um, to support community causes? Yeah, that's a, it's another great question and we do it different ways. So within the Fund2 Foundation, we have a few pillars that we focus on. And some are very specific measurements of what's the cost per, per, I'll say per kid. In some cases it's delivered per kid that, that and, and the efficacy of it. And in some cases, like we do a thing called a restoration retreat, right? Restoration retreat, we do at my ranch. And we get 60 kids per cycle. These are kids who've been exposed to violence in their communities um, at a young age. There is no measurement outside of giving them tools to cope. Right, so there's some things we can actually say, oh, you know, math for instance, okay, how much are we spending per kid and how many of them go to college and what percentage graduate? And, oh, we, yeah, we do all that for certain of those. And then others, it's just like, okay, well, well, you know, what's the right size? How many kids can we house that it's effective for them that it actually helps them heal and progress? So it all, mm -hmm. you know, but that's why I rely on my aunts. Ah, yeah. <laughs> To say, yeah, I hear you, Robert, but we need to just do this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Okay, <laughs> right. So that's that's part of that dynamic. Hi, Miss. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Hi, Mr. Smith. I'm Shari Chester Anderson. Um, we've heard a lot about your successes. Can you talk about some of the challenges or roadblocks you had in your path to entrepreneurship? Yeah. By yeah, way, she asked the last question I was going to ask you. So oh, great. Okay, great. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> look, I mean, let's give you the statistics, right? Was it 126 trillion dollars of assets on this planet in the asset management field? 1.4 percent go to people of color and women. Hmm. Think about that, right? So there are barriers to forming capital. No question about it. And you have to fight through it every day, okay? You have to demonstrate competence, capability, ability, sound hot hands, good judgment, low loss ratios, all those sorts of things. And you just gotta do it. That's just the nature, of, that's the only way you can make changes and try to expand the opportunity set for people who deserve it. So yeah, you face it every day and you just fight through it every day. That's what I can tell you. 
I think I have time for one more question. So. Front row people should always get the last question. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Smith. Um, I absolutely adore you, sir. I'm oh, so excited that you're here. I was actually able to go to the Power Network and see you at Carnegie Hall. Oh, good. In the snowstorm. It was yeah. worth all How of was it? <laughs> it was fantastic. Good, good to hear. Um, I wanted to ask you about the current fourth industrial revolution that we're mm -hmm. going through. And you talk a lot about broadband and its impact on our community. So what are some tips or what should we be doing to make sure that spaces like New Haven, mm -hmm. I'm from Newark, New Jersey, yep. that Newark is able to be a part of it and not miss this wave of what's happening. Yeah, the important thing, and, and part of what we were doing at Carnegie Hall <clears throat> was, was I'll call bringing awareness to this. We were just talking about it in there. Yeah. Just to give you guys just some context, uh, and I won't go through the whole thing I went through, but um, you know, 82% of the historically black colleges and universities are in broadband deserts. Um, and if you go talk to, and I'm good friends with CEOs of all the cellular companies, not good friends with friends with all of them, good friends with a couple. Um, and what you go in there, they say, hey, Robert, that's not a broadband desert. I say, let's double click on that. Yes, it is. Okay, you ran your cable right by that neighborhood, but you never put up the stanchions, you never put up the antenna. Mm -hmm. So it is a broadband desert, not by your definition, but if you go on campus, they don't have access. So part of what we're doing is looking to leverage that $65 billion infrastructure bill, which is designed to do that, to enable that capacity to be driven into these communities, these HBCUs, which, by the way, graduate 50% of the black engineers, 85% of the black doctors, and I think it's 40% of the black judges, mm -hmm. right? And yet 70 of them, 70 of these 140 uh, or 108 don't actually have broadband access to the level that you all have it here. How do you handle this in New Haven? You gotta go talk to every one of the politicians. They have got to get it in those communities. Have the communities, I just had the, the leaders of the uh, 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 Congressional Black Caucus write a letter to all of them signing it to Gina Ramundo, because actually it's out of her office mm -hmm. that they actually deliver to the states. And now I've got, we got at least one federal person to sign for each of the states. Now I got it, I was on with Mitch Landry on Friday. I said, Mitch, give me the name of each one of these people in these states so I can now connect them to my people so we can actually get this done. What do you have to do that? It's like a knife fight, okay? And you gotta get involved in it. And otherwise, it's not gonna happen. I will tell you now, it's not gonna happen unless you get involved. So we're just driving the call to action to get involved for the communities who need this and care about it. America has a couple of problems. One of the biggest is we now have shut our borders, and so that's going to actually create a conundrum, conundrum for the Fed. Okay, The Fed's sitting back saying, okay, I want to drive inflation down. Great, we're going to get the energy and, you know, and the commodity inflation and food and all. We, we will get that under control. Wage inflation, we will not. America needs immigrants in order to grow and manage wage mm -hmm. inflation. Go anywhere in this country, and service workers, you all may argue differently, they're making 100 to 175% of what they made three years ago. Mm -hmm. That is not sustainable. Mm -hmm. It is not sustainable. Yeah, technology is going to you know, obviate the need for some of that, mm -hmm. but we got a problem. I got 800, well, not me, we have... 2.8 million open recs right now globally for software developer jobs, okay? 800,000 of those are in the U.S. And in the service economy from, you know, from harvesting vegetables to serving at, at, at the, uh, at the um, you know, fast food restaurants, mm -hmm. okay, that gap is even bigger, mm. right? And if you can't get wage inflation under control, the wages, the Fed's never going to get this down to 2%, mm. period. Now, they're going to have to rethink, well, maybe not 2%, right? Which you all know is going to have a massive implication on the capital in this, in this, on this planet, let alone this country, yes. okay? We have got to open up responsible immigration reform here in order to handle wage inflation. Otherwise, we're going to be in a world of trouble for the next six years. That's my sense. We've run out of time. There's so many other things I could ask you, but I'm respectful of your time and want to ensure that I leave a moment to express on behalf of the whole school and my personal feeling, uh, my deep appreciation. You're taking time out of what must be an extraordinarily busy schedule 
to come speak with us today. Thank you so much, Robert. It has been fantastic. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you all.